This conference will right, this conference will now be recorded. There you go. Um, good evening. I hope, it, I hope it takes. Um, that happened once before, and the recording did not take. Huh. Okay. Do you think we should stop it and start it again? Well, no. I, I think maybe if we can wait like three or four minutes and then try again. It was a glitch that they wouldn't admit was a bug, but it definitely affected our recording a couple of months it ago. Said it said recording in progress, but I'll stop. Yeah, okay. it so we'll start. yeah there's a recording icon at the top left hand corner. Yeah, I know. It shows it's recording, but it's not. Okay. So they said to wait a couple of minutes, and hopefully that will work. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, welcome, Ravi. And um, like I said, you're new to the group, um, but not to me. So please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm glad to be part of the group. Um, my name is uh, Ravi Subramanya. Um, I'm 62 years old. Um, I live in uh, Maryland um, in, in, in the suburbs of uh, a suburb of D.C. called Germantown. Um, with my wife and daughter, who is 20 years old and um, is in her second year of uh, third year of college, um, studying music. Um, I was I work for the um, Environmental Protection Agency, and for the past one year, have been um, doing a bit of a sabbatical at the um, at the Senate, U.S. Senate, working for um, the senator from New Mexico called Ben Ray Lujan. Um, and in the middle of all that, um, I just started in January, but um, I also got diagnosed with prostate cancer <laughs> in, um, in roughly around that, around February, um, early February. And um, um, my, uh, my Gleason score is, is fairly high. It's nine. Um, they couldn't uh, do surgery on me because of the uh, advanced nature of the cancer. Um, and um, also because I had uh, terp surgery, and uh, so they thought they felt several surgeons they consulted felt that um, surgery would the, the the risk of complications was uh, too high, post surgical complications was too high, and so I've gotten started for a while. I I must say, for a while I went through this very fairly indecisive phase of. Uh, trying to join a clinical trial and all that, but all, all that dust has sort of settled. And I've started my therapy, which has been um, um, hormone and um, uh, androgen deprivation therapy. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be doing that for um, uh, two years. Um, after the first um, two months, I'll be going into radiation for, uh, for eight weeks. Um, my cancer has not metastasized, so I feel very hopeful, and I look forward to um, hearing of others' experiences. And what was your Gleason score and your PSA? Uh, my Gleason score was nine. Um, my PSA uh, was four point seven. And that wasn't that a five plus four, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was five plus four and four plus five in another area, and and four plus three in some area, a couple of areas, and um, three plus three as well. Right, and um, and you are you're being treated at Hopkins, correct? That's right. So I've been treat my um, my um, uh, radiation oncologist is uh, uh, Dr. Greco. Steven Greco from Hopkins, um, and this, the surgeons that I consulted there were Dr. Parton. I also consulted other surgeons. Did you try it now? Are oh, you trying it again? Let's let's um let's just mute Jeremy. No, here. Blue. Let's mute Jeremy here uh, for a second, and then we'll come right back to you. Got it. Thank you, son. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Um, so, um, and didn't you didn't you also tell me that you had seen 
a medical oncologist? I'm trying to remember. No, I haven't. I've not seen a medical oncologist. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I saw I saw a multidisciplinary team at NIH um, uh, with the with the AI. Yeah, that's right. So there was a, maybe I spoke to you then. Um, there was a medical oncologist as part of that group. So um, do you know the, who that was? Uh, gosh, um, the name is escaping me right now. Male or female? Male, yeah, male. Jim Gully? No. no um, okay, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. In, in so, so anyway, I decided not to not to enroll in their clinical trial. I also tr I looked for a clinical trial at Johns Hopkins, and that too I decided not to. I I got impatient waiting for things. Right. So the the clinical trial at Hopkins was um, to see to help use PSMA um, right. scanning to plan your radiation therapy. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So. Okay. So because there, there, there is a significant risk of my, um, of the cancer having migrated to the lymph nodes, um, it was felt that perhaps that might be useful, um, the use of PSMA to detect small, small domain cancer in the lymph. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, they they just wouldn't give me a date. They wanted me to do two additional biopsies, and um, they were not they were just not getting give, giving me a date. And um, I figured that the that the pluses of of getting into this uh, being able to do the PSMA sort of uh, was outweighed by the risk of uh, waiting. Um, and I just wanted to get on with things. Right, right, right. So. Um... You, you've now had your first yeah, the bike. You, you, that's right. And you were going to do bicalutamide right the way through as well yes. as an LHRH, correct? That's right. Yeah. So I started on bicalutamide, and then um, in in a week, I uh, had the um, Eligard six um, infusion okay. shot. Um, that's so. I've been. It's been five days since I I had my Eligard. Um, um, LHRH shot. And and you got a six month depot shot? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think as I mentioned to you before, um, if it were me, I wouldn't go for the six month shot, but you can, we can talk about that. Um, I would be going for a shorter shot, a uh, shorter time frame, frame shot. Um, and have you had any discussion about whether they can radiate the Prostate gland with SBRT. Um, no, he um, they prefer doing the um, what do you call that uh, IMRT. IMRT. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess my question would be, how do we? I mean, you didn't want to do wait for the PSMA PET, but have you thought about doing it anyway? That's right. To yeah. So sure, to make sure there aren't any metastases that you're missing. So, uh, as I understand it, PSMA will uh, is only available on a clinical trial uh, basis in this country, right? So, um, hopefully, I mean, I, I understand that it's uh, uh, it's that it's awaiting FDA clearance, and there's some decision that's going to be taken end of May. So I'm hoping that uh, yes, that it it should be available to me uh, in due course, you know. So so that's well, not um, actually that's not strictly true. Um, the PSMA, um, I'm forgetting. I'm I'm forgetting. I'm just blanking on the name of the um, the ligand that has been approved. Um, Gallium sixty eight. No, yes. no, the, the, the ligand, the, uh, was it, uh, is it 617 that's been approved? Yes, I, can't, I think so. 617 that's been approved. So the gallium 68, 617 has been approved right now only at UCSF and UCLA. Um, that's right. It's been approved for, um, certainly for metastatic disease. I think it's also been approved by Medicare 
a high risk, but I'm not 100% certain about that. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it has been approved. I think it's been approved only for recurring and metastatic cancers. Um, okay. So, um, I, I should, we should in full disclosure just tell you that Herb um, himself is treated at NIH and mm. he runs a lab there as well. Um, that, that's his side gig after his treatment. <laughs> um, and um, after, after Ann Cannon. Then, I was kidding, uh, after Ann Cannon, your treatment. <laughs> he wants to run a lab at NIH, but uh, I see. By the by, um, so you uh, you are a, you live in Maryland or um, I live Virginia? in Chevy Chase. Uh huh. I see. And we have we have other Marylanders here, isn't that true? Speak up. Many, Speak many. Up, Jake, Jake is a Marylander. Yep. <clears throat> Laurel, Maryland. I'm I'm far far away in Washington D.C. Far yeah, I mean, right. We have we actually have some people in the district and Virginia. Alexandria, Virginia. Don't forget about us across no, the river. Have, <laughs> no, and, and we haven't forgotten about Joel, who lives further out. Right. So there's a substantial number of us uh, in this brotherhood in this in the D.M.V. Right. 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 Um, so um, I think the 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 first question for you, um, Ravi, is, is, is there anything you'd like to ask the guys? And then um, is there anything the guys would like to ask you? Um, yeah, I'd like to know if anyone has, uh, has been through uh, just um, hormonal and radiation therapy for high-risk cancer without, without a uh, yeah, high risk cancer. Okay, so without recurrence. So, so, well, I mean, with with or without recurrence. I was about to say without recurrence, but not necessarily. I mean, uh, I I would like to uh, talk further to such folks to know of uh, what generally to anticipate. Uh, okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> Ted here in Portland, Oregon. I could pipe up. Ahead. That's okay, right? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, a little less than a year ago, I just completed uh, 36 sessions of IMRT and uh, six months of um, uh, Lupron, two three-month shots. Uh, my initial diagnosis was a four plus three. Uh, after the surgery, uh, they discovered tertiary five and the four plus three, uh, and it was persistent after the surgery. So that's why I went on the course of uh, the six months of Lupron and the 36 sessions of IMRT. So right now, it's uh, I just re I just literally saw my urologist today. Uh, it's undetectable. Um, wow, nice. There are yes, believe me, and my testosterone is higher than normal, so that's particularly nice too. Uh, I understand. Uh, there are some questions I want to talk to the group about this later on regarding some blood values, and I, I emailed Rick about this. Uh, some blood values. Uh, but uh, what is there anything that specifically you want to know about the, my experience with the Lupron and with the IMRT besides not wanting to pee all over myself during the IMRT? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I have a lot, lot of questions mostly pertaining to, um, you, you know, generally is, is it true that one, one should anticipate um, incontinence and both fecal and urinary incontinence with, with, with the extent of the therapy that I'm going to undergo? Well, I, I can tell you that I, I did not experience any incontinence as a result of the IMRT and the Lupron therapy, none at all. My incontinence, thank goodness, was not at, severe at all, thank goodness, after my prostatectomy. So I'm very lucky in that regard. Now I do have ED. Um, whether that's the IMRT uh, had it and, our, and Lupron had anything to do with that, uh, I don't know, but I do have ED. Mm -hmm. Robbie, this is this is Peter Kafka, and I'm way on the other side of the country from you. But I was a Gleason. I'm, I was diagnosed as a Gleason nine, <clears throat> and I knew I needed to do something, surgery or radiation or both or whatever, and I ended up doing that. But I, I started out with androgen deprivation. Uh, 
for eight months before I landed on uh, additional therapy. So that was my initial treatment for eight months. Uh, and it was like a holding pattern. It bought me time and um, until I decided what kind of, uh, what to do. And I, I was able to do surgery and then then later on IMRT radiation. And I, anyway, so I've been on, on and off androgen deprivation for seven years. Um, <laughs> But I was diagnosed initially non-metastatic as well, um, and and it, it worked for me. It bought my t bought the time. It won't heal the disease. It never uh, made me incontinent. Um, I'm still not incontinent. I did have I did have rectal dysfunction because of the degree of my cancer. But uh, other than that, I'm okay. Um, so I just um, I just wanted to say, and like you've heard this from me, I think um, when we spoke, Ravi, but I'm probably the closest in diagnosis to you um, and the closest in treatment because, but I was four plus four and not five plus four, so I was two grades lower. Um, that said, uh, I did. Um, 28 months of hormone therapy, uh, IMRT, and uh, of brachytherapy seeds. Um, and I have a durable remission, um, which is a really good thing. And um, not something that a lot of folks with my level of cancer um, have enjoyed. So I feel exceptionally fortunate. Um, and, and I think I've talked to you a little bit about some of the issues around uh, the 28 months of hormone therapy. I know I sent you the pamphlets. Um, and I would say that the first three months, you're not going to experience a whole heck of a lot. Um, and then it's kind of like slow drip chemo. It, it just sort of catches up with you. So a lot of the effects that people suffer from chemotherapy and come very quickly, eventually those come from the hormone therapy when you're on for nine months or longer. And there are ways to combat them. And again, keep coming back to this group will we'll help you. Exercise is, is, is very, very important. Um, and and um, trying to keep your stress levels down. I don't know about working around senators. I don't know how easy it is to keep your <laughs> stress levels down. Um, if the senator tells you that he needs you to get out into the uh, constituency and to visit New Mexico, tell me I'm only one state away from New Mexico. Ah, that's right, yeah. It would be lovely to see you. Um, as far as the incontinence, um, urinary and fecal incontinence, um, in my own case, uh, I had no incontinence. I did have some urgency for several months um related to a, a lot of the radiation but it was very very manageable um i've since suffered with some degree of fecal incontinence but i think that is because first of all i had ibs going in an irritable bowel going in mm -hmm. secondly because i got an awful lot of radiation um and that probably didn't help matters much and and it's very manageable uh, and I don't think that's necessarily typical. Now, on this call, um, there are gents suffering from uh, incontinence, although most of them um, have had a radical prostatectomy, which you're not going to wrestle with, which is, in my view, the right way to go, because the likelihood that you would have gotten a cure from your from your RP was pretty low and you would have had to do the radiation and hormone therapy anyway. Um, I'd like to just ask, is there anyone on this call who has just gone through hormone therapy and radiation, no, um, no radical prostatectomy, no surgery, who can relate to the question that, that, that Ravi asked? I also would like to know what what level of how much your exhaustion level was, Rick. Okay, so I'll co we'll come back to fatigue in a moment, but Jim Barnes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm about um, 
and I, I'm in eight months of ADT so far. So I've, I've had my third injection and I did not have a radical prostatectomy. I had, I, I went for radiation, the SBRT. So I had six, I had six sessions of uh, SBRT, um, which were absolutely painless. Uh, like I joke, it was a lot worse finding a parking spot um, at the hospital. Laying in, a, laying in the uh, machine that get, administered the uh, ra radiation. So I, d I did not have any in incontinence. Um, I had a greater sense of urgency uh, after the radiation and uh, felt some fatigue after I'd have the radiation for a day or two. Um, but um, I didn't have any problem with it. My Those, those side effects that I did have uh, subsided over... Uh, a short period of time, so I don't have any incontinence or whatever now, thankfully. Um, so, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you more in detail about that on online, offline, whatever you, uh, whatever you'd like to do. Oh wow, that's that's great. Thank you. This is very helpful. I yeah. Mean, I mean, I would echo what we just heard from from Jim, is that I just had SBRT, five sessions, and. I'm at no your incontinence, no fecal problems. In fact, you know, I didn't. If I didn't know I was getting radiated, I wouldn't know I was radiated. Really. And I you agree. know, and the other thing is, when you got an SBRT, they make you pee first. Mm -hmm. It's quite. It's the opposite of IMRT. They wanted my bladder full. Well, they wanted mine empty. So I guess it depends on your anatomy. But uh, I mean, again, it's it's a function of your anatomy. But I would certainly ask your radiation radiation oncologist why not SBRT. Mm -hmm. the, I the, could... the, the, the literature shows equivalency in terms of efficacy, and it certainly shows fewer side effects. Mm -hmm. I have a question yeah. about that, Please. Herb. What? I mean, why Why would SVRT really get the widespread coverage that somebody like Ravi needs? You know, I'm also a nine and it got out into the lymph nodes. And so I had an IMRT well, but he based on the idea of covering that. everything. So, so let, let me, let, 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 let me inter hold on a minute, Herb. What we're talking about here is SBRT for the gland and IMRT for the um, for the pelvic girdle. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. So you're now, still getting IMRT. So it's right, almost like so hold using on, seeds. Hold on, John, hold on, hold on. Now, at certain places like at um, like Carbone, Madison University of Wisconsin. They're actually doing trials using fractionated SBRT um, for across the pelvic girdle. There's a couple, there's one radonc, I forget his name right now, uh, but it's somebody that one of our guys has seen. And they are you testing SBRT um, for pelvic girdle treatment, but most places are still using IMRT for, for the pelvic girdle. Go ahead, John. Well, good. I mean, I, I just was thinking that you needed that widespread coverage of IMRT as well. Maybe has the question come up whether to use um, seeds in addition to yeah, so, IMRT? Right. Uh, I'm forgetting. Like, I have a friend with a similar situation who was an eight. He didn't have a radical prostatectomy. He got put on Lupron and then he had... Um, radiation plus seeds and now in less than a year he's got a non-detectable right um so, so that's what i had um le I, I, in the interest of time because because i want to move on by the top of the hour um ravi we'd love to talk to you about fatigue um come come on in next week and we'll we'll try and hit it um Thank you. For the next, for, you know, but but I don't think it's going to really bother you at least mm. for the first three to six months. I see. Um, I see. But after that, I can pretty much guarantee that there is not one person 
on this screen that hasn't experienced fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, it just comes with the territory and we can help you figure out some, some ways to, to manage it. Um, and we will help you. But as you can see, um, just from tonight, there's an awful lot of experience in here. I will connect you and Jim Barnes um, by email after Thank the call. You. And so you guys can talk together. Um, and what I'd like to do next is move on to Eric, who, Eric, you have the lie of the land. Uh, you figured out or you heard what we um, ask new guys to do. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your situation? Sure. Um, so I am, um, I'm 49 years old. I, I had prostate, I detected with prostate cancer, cancer and treated for prostate cancer in 2018. I had brachytherapy. Uh, then as of November of 2020, my uh, PSA um, shot up to nine. And so now um, I go this Friday to, uh, well, I, and I had several, I had several scans, PET scans, um, uh, MRIs, uh, most of the, all the MRIs and everything came back normal, but the PET scan uh, came back and said that, you know, it showed some suspicious, it, um, Doc said it looks some suspicious lymph nodes. Uh, so I go this Friday for uh, another scan to start my hormonal treatment and uh, radiation therapy. Uh, the trial drug that I was going to be on is, uh, he want to put me on, I think it's Orgovox, it's O-R-G-O-V-Y-X. Yeah. Uh, want to put me on that for four weeks and then give me six weeks of radiation. Okay, and then how much, how, how much Orgovix after the six weeks? They didn't say. Okay, so let me ask you a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, um, where do you live? Oh, I'm sorry. I live in Glen Burnie, Maryland. I'm another Marylander. Another Marylander. What part of Maryland are you? Glen Burnie. Glen, oh, Glen, okay, well, we're being that, overrun that's by... That's part of Baltimore. Okay. So we're being overrun by terrapins here tonight. <laughs> um, and um, where were you treated originally? So uh, originally I was treated at um, Chesapeake Urology. Um, okay. My gynecologist um, urologist was Dr. Goldfarb. Okay. Um, and then I went to see, I can't remember the doctor's name, to actually do the seed implants. Right. Um, and then uh, I didn't do. I, I didn't feel the communication was there, or the expectations were set for me to see. So I switched, and now I am seeing uh, Doctor Song out of Johns Hopkins. Ah, okay. So that's what we were going to ask you. So you're now seeing Doctor Song, who who's a radiation oncologist, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's great. That that's great. I'm delighted that you're that you're at Hopkins. That was a smart move on your part to get your ass over to Hopkins. Um, yeah, I was um, I was also at Chesapeake Urology. Okay, okay. Um, now, what was your original Gleason score, Eric? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I think it was rather low. I think I want to say I have I don't have the paperwork in front of me, but I think it was like the like one. No, it would have been. Three plus three or three plus four, maybe. Or okay. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah. So I don't. I don't know that. I'll have to look at the paperwork yeah. and find that it's out. Very important because it also impacts how long um, you should do your Orgovix for how long you should do your Orgovix. Um, okay. And so you you'll need to come back and you'll tell us that. Okay. And um, what was your PSA when you got diagnosed back in two thousand and eighteen? Uh, it was of four. Four, okay. Um, so not 
that, that's not too bad. And then did it go down um, or how low did it go after your brachytherapy? It went to, uh, in July of 2020, it was down to 2.5. Okay, so it never got below 2.5, which, you know, can be fairly normal with, with, with brachytherapy. That's, that's, it's not unusual. Um, and then, and then it climbed up to nine and, um, and now you're jumping in. Um, and do you know what sort of PET scans they, they did to determine whether you had suspect um, lymph nodes? Um, it, I don't know what it is, but I have my chart up. It's, it was like radio pharmaceutical. This is 13.2 MCI F-18 flosoclavin injection yeah. four. Yeah, so it was, so it was, um, it, it was an 18F scan. Um, was it with Axiomin? Do you, does does that ring a bell? Axiomin? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they so they so they detected the suspect um, with, with with an Axiomin scan. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's all pretty helpful. Couple of things I just want to tell you, and then we'll well same thing. We'll we'll throw it open to the guys, and you may have questions for the guys. Um, we have a um, a special group um, for men under sixty because mm -hmm. we recognize that the guys under sixty really have different considerations, and they don't like hanging out with the old farts all the time. <laughs> So um, once a month, we it's the second Thursday of the month, we have a group just for younger guys. I would definitely, definitely encourage you to attend that group. Um, have you signed up? Oh, how did you find us, I should ask? Just a Google search, you know. Um, you know, okay. after talking to the, after talk to the doctor and I was, online trying to research and figure some of this stuff out and i just it was driving myself crazy and so i just you know was looking for a support group and i came across this group okay well that that's great um we need your email so we can put you so we can send you reminders and we can send you a reminder for the younger for the young for the under 60s group okay so if, if you want to put that in the chat window if you want to send it directly to me um mm -hmm. give Give, give us your last name and we'll get you onto that group. Um, we meet, um, or you can sign up yourself. Jake's just put the place to sign up in the, um, in the chat window. Uh, we meet every single week, um, either on a Monday night or a Tuesday night, four weeks in the month. We don't meet in the fifth week of the month. Um, so you just keep coming back here. We'd like to hear what your Gleason score was. Um, let me throw it open. Well, first of all, do you have any um, questions for the guys? What would you like to hear from them? Just, I mean, like, just really like, just what to, I mean, just what to expect. Um, is, is there anything that I should be going in and asking, um, it, it, you know, what, Anything that's been, you know, helpful. I mean, at this point in time, anything that's helpful because I, you know, I just have no idea what to expect. Sure. Who, who would like to talk about what to expect with recurrent treatment? We've talked a little bit about it already. Anybody else want to jump in with recurrent treatment? Yeah. So the other thing that kind of got, you know, kind of got me worried because, you know, doctor said, you know, it's a twenty-five percent chance that you know, this treat. you know, the, the session of hormonal therapy and radiation will, for lack of a better word, cure it. And he said, if it, if it doesn't, he said, you know, I, I have about five to 15 years of life left. Well, we're not big fans of docs who start giving you numbers for a whole bunch of reasons. But the one thing that I would like to I want to bring Jim Barnes back in here um, because not so long ago, 
uh, Jim's a younger guy, and not so long ago, he was sitting in a chair a bit similar to yours, and he was very nervous, Nelly. And um, Jim, this this probably sounds a bit familiar to you, what Eric is saying, right? Sure. I mean, I first joined a group here. I was freaked out, I, you know, not knowing what was going on, trying to figure everything out. And, uh, you know, it's uh, once once you get you get settled in and you figure out the treatment options and, um, you know, your path, um, you know, you just kind of kind of go with it. And, uh, you know, you look at all the guys on these calls and everything, everybody, most everybody that I've seen is living full and healthy lives. And, uh, you know, and uh you know happy so you know sure there's there's side effects and everything that that suck but all in all you know it's um um you can we can be all be in a lot worse places mm -hmm. any anyone else want to talk to um eric about the anxiety that we all face Come on, guys, where are you all today? You're a vocal lot. Yeah, it's very <laughs> David, David Muslin. David Muslin's waving at me. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I think you're on mute. Yeah, we're not hearing you, David. I think your phone is muted, David. Can I just jump in with one thing while we wait for David? It's, it's, yes. What helps me is, re is recording my meetings. Uh, none of my doctors have ever had a problem with it. And if my wife can't come with me or I'm just freaking out, I can always go back and review the, the meeting on having it recorded. So that's helped me a lot. So there you go. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's Eric, a good suggestion. So Sylvester is here. Sylvester, you've been dealing with this for over 20 years, right? Yes, this will be my 27th year. I had a prostatectomy in 1999. And I, I, I must say this, Pro, uh, treatment has progressed tremendously since I got my diagnosis. And my urologist gave me a book to read. The more I read, the more confused I became. In fact, in fact, there was no sessions like this at that time that I knew of. The saving grace for me is that I, my doctor recommended that I go to the Prostate Cancer Research Institute session in Los Angeles, and I was fortunate enough to meet Rick Davis, who introduced me to this session maybe about five years after my diagnosis. And uh, I thought my world had ended when I got the diagnosis. Uh, my doctor didn't tell me it had, it had ended. When he told me I had prostate cancer, I didn't hear anything as he said. Although he may have told me not to be that concerned, I didn't hear that. The only thing I heard is that I had prostate cancer. And that, that, I don't know how long the session lasted after that, but that's all I heard him say other than, I'm gonna set you up for a biopsy. And I later had radiation and I did have some side effects from the radiation. But thanks to this group, and similar groups, my world has expanded much wider than I would have ever imagined when I got my first diagnosis, my only diagnosis for prostate cancer. So for those of you who have been newly diagnosed, your saving grace is that there are, there are excellent treatments and while it may change your life forever, you'll still be living if you want to. And I think that's why you come to these sessions 
because you learn things that will help you care for yourself. And that's about it. Yeah, thank, thanks, thank, Peter. Thanks, thank everybody, for listening. Yeah, thank you, Sylvester. We always love listening to you. You don't speak very much in this group, but we always it's always a pleasure to hear you, man. Um, I, I think what one of the things we want to say to you um, is, Eric, one of the things we want to say to you is the treatments for this disease are moving so rapidly and so quickly, we don't know how long somebody with re <coughs> recurrent disease can live today. We just don't know. What we do know is that we probably can't talk about cure. What we can talk about is managing this disease. Sometimes if you're very fortunate like I was without any treatment, sometimes with treatments, but managing it for years and years and years. So. The last thing we want you to be thinking about is, oh, well, you know, I, I've got five years to go or I've got 15 years to go. You could have years and years to go. And and we don't like doctors that are going to sort of give you that type of prediction when we don't have the evidence. Um, we, we don't have good evidence. You know, the, a lot of the evidence that, that the doctors base this on are, are around drugs that were used um, years ago that have been superseded with much better drugs. Um, so, uh, David Muzzin, can we hear you now? No. Speak up again. Say something. No. Is your phone muted? Or uh, he says, "Go ahead, go without." He's not on the phone anymore, Doug, Rick. Oh, he's not on the phone anymore. No, he was holding up a phone. He's holding the phone. Yeah, he was. He just hung up and he's dialing back in. Any anyone else want to say anything to Eric? Uh, well, yes. I mean, Eric. So I I thought Sylvester said it as well as anybody could possibly say it, and hopefully I'm around for as long as he's he is. But when I first got diagnosed, I thought it was going to be curtains within no time. And but then my oncologist said, look, our goal is to make this a chronic disease. And, you know, while, as we said, cures are not likely, the, the therapies we have now and are coming along are pretty certain to do that. So I think, you you know, to say a fixed time, I think you, you're, it's misleading and it's ignorant. Okay. All right. Uh, Les, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yes, I think that the doctor's predictions are based on their personal experience, which may not be up to date. Uh, I have Gleason 10, and I was when I was diagnosed, they gave me less than two years to live. Uh, that was eight year over eight years ago. So uh, I think, given a definite time frame can be very misleading. They are going by their experience. That particular doctor that told me that had seen one other Gleason 10 in his lifetime. How many years ago that was, I don't know. Uh, but it was that prediction may have been accurate uh, based on his one example. So I, I think it's very misleading to hear a, a prediction on time frame. Thank, thank you. Now we'll try David. We'll try David Muslin for the third time of asking. Are How's you... that? And can, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I can't. I, number one, Sylvester, you're amazing. You're you're absolutely my hero of the of the week. What you said, you're so eloquent and so articulate, and you're spot on. And uh, you've got Eric. What this group has done for me is given has changed my complete attitude about prostate cancer, and I was scared shitless. I was getting my affairs in order, and uh, 
And I think that I'm going to live to an, another 25 or 30 years when I'm in my 90s. So it, this is, is very treatable and life is beautiful. And this group has totally relieved all my anxiety. And I've learned so much and, uh, and I'm so grateful. So it's a beautiful thing. I'm glad you're here, Eric. And you're a young man and you've got many, many years to go. And we, and we love having you here, David. When we can hear you, we love having you. When we can't hear you, we still love having you. So, um, yeah, okay, sure. um, can I, can I, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, go um, ahead very Rick, quick. You, you said something that, that caught my attention. Can I, and can I ask a question? Um, Rick, you said that you don't, you can't quite expect to get cured, you said. That's right. Um, what, I see. So, so is 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 it correct? Then, what are you saying that your your cancer keeps coming back? It doesn't necessarily keep coming back, but it doesn't go away either. What so does that mean? It, well, what it means is that if you um, if you are a Gleason, if you have a four in your number, that's essentially what they say. We can't really talk about cure. We can we can say that you've got. There was there was a famous old Janita urinary medical oncologist. He's still around, but he has um, Parkinson's at this point. Uh, doesn't practice, but some of you may have heard of him, Snuffy Myers, and he coined the uh, expression a uh, continuing durable remission. And um, and that's basically what we live with. So this disease can come back after 15 years. It can come back after 20 years. So we never really know um, if we are still going to get struck or not. Um, and 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 that's why we don't use the cure word. And I think. Um, that physicians who do use the cure word are, are really misleading you. What we can expect is that for some of us who are very lucky, um, we may not need more treatment, but every year we have to test to make sure the disease hasn't come back. And for some of us who are less lucky, we can use medical treatment to manage the disease. Ravi, okay. they, they like to use the term no evidence of disease. If, let's say if your PSA is undetectable, rather than say cure, you, they just say you have no evidence of disease, NED. So um, we get, we're going to move on. Eric, I hope you've heard enough to make you want to come back. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Next week, we've got a meeting on Tuesday. And then, um, Ken Anderson, don't we have a meeting with your guys on Thursday next week? Are you there, Ken? So, Ken, um, Ken leads the... Yeah, um, we do, Rick. There you go. Yeah, okay. So, hopefully, you'll be able to welcome Ken to your... Um, your it's a little smaller than this, Eric. Right, right Ken? Yeah, by all means, Eric. It's, I believe, 7 p.m. on Thursday for you. Okay. Yep, and you'll get a you'll get a reminder from um, you'll get a reminder from um, uh, from Ken sometime next week. We'll sign you in right at the end. I'm just going to take um, two minutes, um, very very quickly, um, to go back to. Um, Vanita, are you still with us, Vanita? She's on mute. You're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Are you with us? Okay. Well, I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about where you practice, where you work. Um, but come on back on <coughs> excuse me a different at a different time um and um and and you'll tell us um what i'm going to do now is find out who needs some time tonight and um 
we'll try and get around everybody. We'll do our best to get around everybody. Um, so, and hopefully I've gotten everybody written down, but forgive me if I if I missed anybody. So, um, Jake, anything you'd like to update us about? That? Yeah, how about updating updating us on your conversation with uh, with Dr. A at Hopkins? I don't really have any news yet, Rick. I'm okay. waiting to hear back from him, I hope. Okay, all right. Well, all right. Um, Herb. Yes, I have some something to say. Okay. Um, Bruce, anything for you tonight? Yeah, just real quickly. Uh, <clears throat> okay, okay, okay. We'll come back to you. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm just, sorry. I'm just polling. I'm just polling to see who... Who gotcha, needs some gotcha. um, Carl, anything for you tonight? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Peter Kafka, anything for you? No, I'll pass. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got another Peter in here. Who was that? I'm drawing a blank. Do I have another? Yes. Uh, the other Peter, anything for you? I don't think Peter Monaco is on the call. Is that who you're thinking of? No, there's, um, PF. I'm trying to, I, I'm not sure who it is. I'm drawing a blank and I'm embarrassing myself, but it's a Peter. That's no, Paul, PF is Paul Frieda. Oh, that's Paul Frieda. That's, oh, that's, uh, that's why I fooled myself. And put him in twice. Paul Freed, or anything for you? No, I'm good tonight. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Ted, you said you wanted to, you had a question, so I've got a tick by you. Jim Marshall, anything for you? Negative. Okay, thank you. John A, anything for you? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, Les, anything for you? Not tonight, thanks. Okay, Pat Martin, anything for you? I'm good. Thank you. Carlos, anything you'd like to raise? Yes, I know. I've lost Carlos. Yes or no, Carlos? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, Dennis C., anything for you? Yes, Rick, please. Okay. Um, Jim B., anything for you? I do not, Rick, thanks. You're good. Did you, you're good. Did you say nothing? Correct. Nothing. Thanks. Uh, Stan F. Anything for you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Jimmy G. Anything for you tonight? No, thank you, sir. Okay, John I. Anything for you? No, thanks. Thank you, Sylvester. Anything for you? No. No, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, Joel, anything that you'd like to raise? Uh, no, thanks, Rick. Len, anything you'd like to raise? Niente, nothing. Thank you. Russell, anything for you? No, but thank you. Okay. Um, David M., anything for you? No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Um, Jeff, anything for you tonight? Not today, thank you, Rick. Thank you. Bob, another Floridian. Anything for you tonight? You there, Bob? You're muted. I'm Bob from Hawaii. I don't know if there's oh, a Floridian Bob from, oh, it's no. not. Oh, it's okay. It's a different Bob. Are you new to the group, Bob? Anybody hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Are you new to the group? Bob, Bob, can you can you hear us? I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm yes, I'm Bob from Hawaii. Okay, uh, are uh, you new to the group? Yes. Okay. Um. Well, we have to. What? Well, here's what I'd love for you to do. Um. 
If you can come back next Tuesday, we will give you priority to take time to tell us about yourself. Peter, do you know Bob? I don't think so. What island are you from? I'm on Maui. Uh, Big Island. Okay, I'll, I'll put my number in the chat window and you can call me up, okay? Okay. That'd be great. And Bob, please come back. Um, you only put in Bob, and I th we thought I thought it was a different Bob and didn't recognize you as being new. Um, so please come back next Tuesday. Um, at what time, Peter? Next Tuesday on on, on Hawaii. Noon. 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 Noon next Tuesday in Hawaii, and we would love to talk to you. Um, I think Herb is in, who's in the chair? No, Peter's in the chair. So Peter will be, Peter will be, Peter will be chairing the meeting, but he'll already have a handle on what's going on with you. So please um, come on back. Gary, anything for you? Gary? Okay. Going, going, gone. Is Rusty still with us? I saw him come in and then I saw him leave. Oh, hold on. Go ahead, Gary. Can't Go hear ahead. you, Gary. We can't, can't hear you. No, it shows your microphone being on, but we cannot, we can't hear you. So, did you need time? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes, you do. You do need time. But if we can't hear him, he's not going to be able yeah, to. Yeah. Well, maybe the best thing you can try and do is to go out and come back in again. I I'm not sure what to tell you, but we'll 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 try and stop by you a little bit later. Rusty um, has gone. Ken Anderson, anything for you? Yes, Ken well, has some good news. Well, I thought I already shared it in the chat window. I was sending a message to Jake, but I sent it to everyone. No, I think that went to the organizers only. Oh, no worries, no worries. I can give an update, sure. Okay, okay. Jeremy, we want to hear from you. We haven't heard from you for ages. <laughs> yeah. Kang. I'll update the question. Okay, Kang, anything from you for you, Kang? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott Hogan, welcome back. Um, we're going to start with you, Scott, if you can hear us. Can you hear us? Yes, Rick. Rick, we also have John Lowe, who just joined us. Okay. Um, John Lowe. John Lowe's been with us. You've been with us before, haven't you, John? I believe one time. Yeah, I, I remember your name. Um, did you need time tonight? Yes. Okay. So we're going to try and do our best to get around everybody. I'm just going to give you a heads up that um, we may go over tonight. Uh, let me just see. Do I have anybody in the room after us? No. We, no, I don't have anybody in the room after us. So we may well go over. Um, all right. So let's... Um, some of you remember Scott, um, who was with us frequently about over the last 12 months. We didn't hear from him for a while. And Scott will tell you why that is. And, you know, let, let's spend a little time with you, Scott. Thank you, Rick. It's such a pleasure to see you and the other gentlemen. Basically, about a month ago, I had my whole life flipped around. I was on the the chemo medication, low PSA, but everything changed dramatically. I had uh, cancer navigated to my spine, spinal cord compression. I'm now from the neck down paralyzed. And I've been dealing with that. I've been a rehab here for a couple weeks 
to going home, but it's everything stopped. I mean, literally everything in my life flipped around. Grateful for this group, and I decided we need to come back. I'm also in another small group, but by golly, guys, I would appreciate any support, and likewise, be willing to give support, just like Rick does. Others, so thank you for listening. Well, I, I think I think that since we have an expert on the call in this field, we should probably call on him first. But when you, Herb, when you joined us, I don't think you've seen Scott before. No, Scott was not a no. member. And, but Scott was, many of you do remember Scott, uh, and um, should tell you- Does that mean, I mean, put that Times Square billboard back up there again. This is what it means in the real world. Even with Republicans- oh, Hold on. Can, can, can we, guys, if you're not um, speaking, I'd really appreciate it if you could mute, it would help us a lot. Um, leave your mic on, please, Scott. I don't wanna make life any more difficult for you. Um, what I was gonna say to you is that um, Herb runs a lab at the National Institute of Health for um, brain and spine injuries. So if there's anybody familiar with your situation from a medical standpoint, and it's probably Herb, and um, Herb, why, why don't I let you talk to Scott a little bit? Herb yeah. now moderates for us, by the way. Herb is one of our moderators. So, yeah, Scott, so, this, so you had, I guess what you're saying is you had no inkling that this was going to happen. That is correct. I, I was working uh, as a teacher. I've been a high school teacher for years. Mm -hmm. and I hate to use the word all of a sudden, but that's exactly what happened. I went to the ER a couple times. And yes, nothing, nothing prepared me for this. Right. Well, I think it's a pretty devastating event. I certainly am totally sympathetic with what's happening. I mean, I'm assuming that you've talked to neurosurgeons who say they can't decompress. Uh, I, no, I've never had that conversation. Mostly it's been, we did radiation. I did 10 sessions of radiation about three weeks ago. And the conversation was, you know, I mean, this is something, if it could be reversed, gosh, I'd be the first guy in line. But no, that's mm -hmm. not the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how much tissue is left and what's there. So it's, I mean, every, all of us at our age have a certain degree of spinal cord compression. So that's sort of a danger for getting old anyway. So unfortunately, put, you know, did, when they did a scan, did they, they basically have did an MRI and found this kind of a really devastating situation? Yes. Hmm. Well, Maybe you and I could talk as a very I'm happy, you know, Scott, I mean, we've been emailing and I'm happy to do it offline if there's any way that I can be of use. That's so I think I'm, that's probably the, the thing for us to do. Right, because there's so many guys, and Rick does a fabulous job, there's so many guys, I don't, don't want to take up any more time. But so I, where, are you, where are you located? Arizona. Mm-hmm. Oh, can you hear me? So, yes, 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 we can hear you. So I, 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 you know, I think let me let let me and Scott do this offline, because I think that's more useful. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll make sure. I'll, I'll, but if there are other, but obviously, I'd like to let other people sure. say something. Sure. So, um, why don't we? Um, I'll connect um, 
notes. I'm just making you notes, Scott and Herb. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll definitely connect you a little bit later. Um, and um, anybody else like to talk to, to, to Scott? Just God bless you, man. We'll keep you in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, this is Jake. Did you have any luck with the uh, dragon, naturally speaking? No, I actually, our son helped me. I'm going to hold up. He helped me get this device to talk to text. If anybody's oh. interested in that, I'd gladly share. But this is how I send emails uh, to talk to text. The dragon was just way beyond what I could afford. So. Ah, that's cool. Uh, very good. Congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear you got something anyway. Um, you know, there's also a number of, and, and maybe we can dialogue a little bit, or you know, one of one of our guys can can volunteer to help you. But there are a number of resources for people like yourself um, if if there's equipment you need that you cannot afford, and and we would like to be in a position to to direct you to those resources. So. Um, let me think about that a little bit or anybody else um, and we'll see if we can see if we can come up with anything that, that, that might be a potential resource then you know we would have to try and help you figure out how to make the application but we'd love to do that and and by the way we would love to see your wife in the group tomorrow night and I hope she's connected with Debbie with Debbie Swiderski if not she really should connect with Debbie Swiderski. Great. Okay. Um, anyone else um, before we move on? Okay. So, Scott, you know you're always welcome for however long you want, and um, there's not a guy in this room that won't step up to to give you support if you need it. And if any of you want to reach out to, to Scott directly, um, just uh, send me an email and I will connect you to Scott. And the, the more of us that can be talking to him right now, um, the better we are. That's, that's really what we need to be doing. And that's how some of you, if you're willing, can can really provide some good support to him. And we, we we, we hope some some of you will step forward and we'll connect you. Um, okay, um, Herb, why don't you um, you wanted you had an update? Well, I mean, actually, I mean, it was, we just heard from Scott. So, uh, as many of you remember, I had SBRT to my prostate gland, and at that time, the radiation oncologist said, you know, you've got some bone lesions. Let's take a closer look. So last week I had a bone, an MRI, and the conclusion was there were two spots in my vertebrae which harbor disease that they would like to radiate, that he would like to radiate, because he said it would avoid future issues. So, uh, and then the, my medical oncologists got the report and then emailed me saying, you know, we think it's prudent to do it. So have there any of, have there anybody else in the group have had that sort of prophylactic bone radiation, yeah. especially yeah. So, spinal column? So we, we've had a lot of people have spot RT. Um, anybody currently in the group has had spot radiation to the spine? Hmm. I, 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 I have a, can I ask a question? Sure, like, Eric. So, I, when I was talking to the radiologist, it, they were talking about how much radiation the body can take. Right. Can anybody elaborate on that? Because it just because it, it just struck me to ask that question when he was talking about well, you know, radiation. I mean, my under 
my understanding, Eric, is that, I mean, the main thing they want to do is preserve, because in your bone is, is bone marrow. And if you irradiate too long or too much in bone marrow, you can really cause a major crisis. And then the other parts of it is that you don't want to irradiate. You, irradiation kills cells. It will kill cancer cells. It will kill other kinds of cells. So you don't want to send the radiation where you don't want it. So the, the what everybody wants to do is, is get as much radiation in the areas that need it and avoid these places such as bone marrow, which can cause major issues. And likewise, other people, for example, urinary problems can happen and con uh, fecal incontinence if radiation is in the wrong place. So you, the idea is not to irradiate where you don't want it. And the, the other the thing is, I just want to add to that is that, um, that there is a limit as to how much radiation the body can take. But um, when it is highly focused, as in the situation that Herb is talking about right now, um, it's usually SBRT and it's usually for no more than three sessions, usually. Um, if it's IMRT, it can be anywhere from five to 10 sessions but it is not a large amount of radiation. And um, we've known people that had recurrent or salvage radiation and then had several treatments of spot radiation, maybe five different spots have, 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 been, have been radiated. So um, asking about spot radiation is not an unusual situation. Um, Herb, like I say, we, we've had Len, how many people have we seen that have had spot radiation to the spine? Yeah, we've had a few. I, uh, well, Les is raising his hand Les. there. I think he had some. Go ahead, Les. Uh, but but be before we go to Les, can I just ask uh, Herb, uh, did, did you discuss with them, Herb, uh, as an alternative using Zofigo instead of spot radiation? No, I didn't, but uh, I... My own sense is I'm not ready for radium 223. Yeah, I think they'd rather do it spot. Yeah, and and I I'd agree with you, Herb. I mean, radium 223 is a very general treatment. It's not a focused treatment, and I think spot and it may compromise you in terms of getting a lutetium 177 treatment, and and for me. Um, I think spot radiation might be um, the way to go. Um, you know, the, the issue with the spot radiation is to know when to quit. Um, you know, we've had we have people that have done spot radiation time and time again. It's like whack-a-mole. Um, and and I think the biggest concern I have with spot radiation is. Um, is it really effective or should we really be looking at a systemic treatment? Um, I'm just not a fan of radium. Two. I don't disagree with Len about the systemic treatment. I'm just not a fan of radium 223. Um, Les, you, you, you've had spot radiation to the spine? Yeah, so I had two spots that uh, they did a cryoablation on one time and a couple of years later it showed up in one of the spots and there they did the uh, spot radiation, but I don't have too much uh, that I can really say about it one way or the other. Uh, I think there were other spots that uh, existed at the time, so my uh, PSA did not go down. So I think it's like what you just said. Uh, it needed uh, some more stomach uh, uh, process, and that's what they did. They put me then on uh, uh, hormone treatment. So I don't have too much to say about the spot radiation other than it it probably did its job on that one spot, but that wasn't the only thing. So, yeah, I mean, you've looked at the research, Herb, and, and I think what you've probably seen is that in the context of oligometastatic disease, um, it's it certainly yeah. tends to, to restrain the disease. But the use of spot radiation for metastatic disease unless it's palliative um, is 
is questionable in terms of how it's going to manage the disease. Right, I mean, I think it's their thoughts were it's not pal it's palliative in the sense that they felt that if it increased around those spots, I would ultimately have major issues with pain okay. and spinal cord compression. Then I think it makes sense. So that's what it was explained to me, and you know, obviously, I wouldn't have just taken the radiation oncologist at his word because they they don't make money if they don't radiate. So, um, but the concurrence of my medical team made it stronger. Okay. Yeah, I mean, definitely, there's a good reason if they think that it's likely to result in a collapse of the spine. Then yes, I think um, I think there is there is good reason. But to go after spots um, when you're clearly metastatic with spot radiation, I think that's where it becomes questionable. Yeah, um, I mean, they pointed out there are other spots that they're not going to radiate because they don't think that they would cause ma other major issues. Right. So um, let's... Um, let's We can move on. And, yeah, we, 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 we have to keep moving on. Bruce, tell us what's on your mind. Yeah, just real quick, after the last time we talked, uh, um, you know, I was told you I was looking to get a, an Oxum PET scan, you know, I, I'm, I'm 0.24, and you advised me that's probably too low, and to look into a PSMA as well. Uh, we got the thing scheduled, the insurance improved it. The night before, I got a call saying that, well, the insurance is not approving it now, probably because it's only 0.24, and they weren't going to detect anything anyway. So. I reached out to my doctor and all the information you guys loaded me up with, um, you know, I was very well prepared and uh, he agreed with everything I had to say and said, you know, I mentioned a PSMA and he said, well, the only thing you'd have to do is try and get in a trial because there's none in the area. And I, I'm currently trying to do that. But he just says, let's go ahead and test your PSMA or your PSA uh, in another 60 days and see where we stand. So I'm just kind of in a holding pattern. Okay, I, and, and you know, I think the big thing right now is at 0 0.24, you're probably not even gonna see anything on a on a PSMA scan. Um, I agree. Any, anybody wanna comment on that for, for, for Bruce? No? Nobody. Yeah. Oh, Bruce, what do you know what the PSA doubling time is? Yeah, yes, I do. I do. And I and, and, and I mentioned that to him too. And he says, Yeah, you don't even meet that. But 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 the thing is, is it it it's been non-detectable. It, it it did go to point two, then it went back down to point one eight, and now it's at point two four. And I says, look, you know, do you just want to be aggressive here and, and try and take care of it? And he says, well, that's, you know, that, that's my main thought. And of course, I'm with that as well. Um, but again, you guys are mentioning radiation. I don't want to go go do that. If, you know, we're going to go radiate something that we don't even know where it's at. Can I uh, step in for a sec? Uh, sure. My uh, PSA, was, uh, my it was persistent after the prostatectomy. Uh, it averaged around two-ish, two, 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 one, two, three. Um, I had an oxum. It did show uh, localized activity on my bladder neck. And so they went on a course of uh, IMRT radiation in my pelvic area. And then they did some extra zapping on the bladder neck. So it did find something, but it was inconclusive. I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, and of course, you were already at 2.0 versus 0 0.2. And, and I think that, that that's is, correct. Yeah, I mean, that's really the key that we just have to wait till it gets to a level where we can see something. And at that yeah. point, it makes lots and lots of sense. Um, I'm going to keep rolling comment, here. Um, if that's okay by you, Bruce, Carl, Carl um, speak up. Okay. Um, I am uh, uh, about four weeks into my trial with Dr. Tagawa at Wild Cornell ARV 110. I am meeting with him uh, tomorrow. I have been told by a fellow warrior who has Dr. Petrolak as his oncologist, and Dr. Petrolak is out of uh, in New Haven at the Yale School of Medicine. He, I believe, is the originator of the ARV-110 trial, 
and uh, my friend discussed a little bit without disclosing who I was, dis uh, discussed of my situation. And um, he did uh, disclose that he's looking to add an immunotherapy drug to the ARV-110. And my, my general question, if, if somebody can uh, answer it, is that if, if they do add the second drug, the immunotherapy, does that mean uh, that my current trial will, will or will not get that second drug? And would that be considered a brand new trial? So before we go to that, why don't you tell us what's going on over these four weeks? What sort of results are you getting from what is this a phase two or phase three that you're in with the ARV? Uh, it's a phase two. And, and uh, yeah, go for ahead. Me personally, for me personally, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed because I, I've always been looking at uh, PSA as the main criteria for my. Uh, control of my disease, and um, my PSA had started out at uh, 4.3 in day one of the trial. Uh, it is, as of last week, it's 4.6. And uh, Dr. Tagawa has said to me, in no uncertain terms, don't focus on the PSA. So we'll see. Uh, and what does Tagawa think you should focus in on, scans? Well, yes, and, and the scans uh, based upon the protocol for the clinical trial is that in four weeks' time, I will have the scans, so I have four weeks to go. Okay, so basically they're scanning, they're scanning every eight weeks, and, and we don't really know where you are, and for those of you who don't know what ARV10 is, um, it's a drug that, um, that, that destroys the androgen receptors. Is that a fair way to describe it, yes. Uh, Carl? Yes, yes. Um, and um, and the androgen receptors, receptors are what um, feed the cancer. They, they link the testosterone in your body to, to the cancer. Um, so, Herb, can you enlighten us a little bit on this situation with adding another drug to a um, no, no. existing trial? I think if they were thinking about adding another drug, that would have to be a new trial. It would be a different trial. They would have to register it with clinicaltrials.gov and the whole bit. So chances are that even if they decided to do it, uh, I'm not sure. I think you wouldn't get it since you're already in the phase two of the drug alone. I had a feeling. <laughs> so Carl, hey, doesn't that at least represent a slowing down of your doubling time? You only moved from 4.3 to 4.6 in a month. That's that's not too big a move. So it's doing something. And, yes, and, and, and you are correct that Tagawa is also saying the same thing about focusing. He says, well, you're your PSA appears to be somewhat under control compared to my previous acceleration that I've been experiencing for the past two to three months. You're correct. Is there a placebo arm on that study? Might you be on placebo or no? No, no placebo. Everyone's getting the same. Anyone else um, oh, have any thoughts? I have a question. Go ahead, Carlos. Do you know, as a phase two, typically there's a high and a middle and maybe even a low dose, just a high and a low. So uh, at this point, you probably don't know which of the two you might be getting. No, I definitely know that I'm getting the same uh, dosage. The phase one was uh, at the point where they were determining the, the size of the dose, and that's been concluded. And I'm now I'm in the phase uh, two of the trial. So. It's whatever they call the full dose at this point. No, but, but Carlos, Carlos is correct. The, the the phase one is usually only about safety. Is it safe? Phase two is about how much drug to give. That's what a phase two trial is about, changing the dosages. So the likelihood is that there are different dosages being administered. And that's a question for Tagawa. 
um, am I on the high ver dose version or am I on the low dose version? Because that's what a phase two is all about. It's to look at the correct amount of dosage. Is that correct, Carlos? That's, yes. that's my understanding. That is, in fact, what a phase two trial is normally a dose escalation trial to find the optimum dose for if you or if it has any. And then normally they'll also be looking at efficacy to see whether there's any evidence of pushing it to phase three. It wouldn't tell Carl if he's high or low. Wouldn't that have to be blinded, though? Generally, that's correct. I mean, it also could be that some trials and I haven't looked. I, I was just trying to look and find the trial call to just to see what it says. But some of them also are dose escalation where they will that you may not get one dose. They may increase your dose. Hmm. Or what but I don't know. I haven't looked at the trial. What kind of side effects are you experiencing from this? Well, there's definitely extra fatigue on top of what I've already been uh, experiencing. And and one thing I'm going to discuss with him tomorrow is that I seem to be having um, some issues with my walking. Uh, I'm not able to walk as well as I was. I don't know if that's related to possibly the spinal uh, compression. I don't, I haven't been told uh, that, that I have that, but uh, I just hope that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing. Um, I have a question. Are you having swelling to your thighs? Um, well, I was diagnosed with lymphedema as a result of 27 lymph nodes having been renew removed from when my prostatectomy occurred back in November 2018. So I'm under treatment for lymphedema. Okay. The reason I bring that up is because I was on medicines that did cause a lot of swelling. And that was the first thing I actually noticed. It took me a while to really register that. Uh, but just taking a half a mile walk, I was moving fairly slow. And I asked my wife, you know, am I walking well? And all she could say is you're walking slower. Uh, but I do know that on hindsight that once that lymphedema cleared up, um, the strength in my thighs increased back to you know, more or less what it used to be. Uh, and so I think what's happening is the fluid gets into the muscle and it can't contract as well as it should. And so getting rid of that fluid is, is going to be a key item. Uh, I don't know if there are options that you might ask about that. They may want to get you some diuretics. Uh, don't know how they're treating you for the lymphedema. Yeah, no diuretics, uh, uh, physical therapy, and I have wraps uh, that I use. It's primarily my left leg, um, but there's okay. support, yeah. support stockings that, that I wear as well. And I am going to the okay. gym three to four times a week. I'm doing leg presses, um, which I've been told that's one of the most important things to do. So. Uh, absolutely. That, that helps uh, move some of that fluid. Uh, I have ended up using Ted Hose as well as... Uh, uh, these uh, workout type, type of uh, uh, garments that you pull up to your waist, and that would reduce the swelling enough overnight that it's uncomfortable as it would get during the day. So um, we're going to have to we're going to have to keep moving. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, you know, we keep talking about this. In, this is all really good, interesting stuff. Um, but. Um, uh, let, let's stop by Ted Healy to ask him about, uh, he had some questions on his blood count that I said yeah. could answer. Uh, Ted, yes. um, why don't you pose your blood count questions to the guys? Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, so uh, I had my blood panel done, I had a checkup, and uh, it, the type, uh, I was looking possibly at a type two being pre-diabetic, and it turns out that, thank goodness, it's moving away. But what did come up was, that my total protein uh, went uh, to a 5.2. A uh, year earlier, it was at a 6.4. Uh, and then my um, uh, glo globulin, I know I'm not pronouncing it properly, 
uh, went to a 1.3, uh, and then it had been at a 2.6, and then the uh, albumin, sorry, component ratio uh, was at a 3.0, and uh, it had been at a 1.5. So there, there, there's been a change here, and I brought it up in my urologist just today, and he said he, he didn't think it had anything to do with the Lupron. Uh, he thought more of a nutritional issue. So I, I just want to throw it out to the group. So again, to summarize, the pr protein was down, and what were the other two? Hemoglobin. Uh, the the protein was down. The uh, globin, the globin itself, just globin, uh, was down, and the albumin globin globin ratio was up. Okay, Len, this is your, this is your area of knowledge. Anything <laughs> to comment? Yeah. Um... Yeah, albumin globulin ratio, AG ratio, uh, is usually, it's more a function of, a, a, more an indication of kidney function, has, uh, to my knowledge, has nothing to do with uh, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone type drugs or ADT type drugs. I've never heard of it affecting the AG ratio. Uh, how is your, you have the, your other blood tests handy there? Yeah, I, I mean, everything else was within parameters uh, except for the, the total protein i'm sorry what was that line blood urea nitrogen bun was that normal uh it was yes uh yeah i'm not sure uh rick or or ted i'm not yeah. sure the significance of your changes in your ag ratio there um it was also it was also the, the protein as well, and the uh, globulin also, both of them. And, and again, my urologist said that he felt it might be a nutritional issue. My primary wants to wait. It's not going to be three weeks, and then we'll do it again. But um, yeah. it could, uh, Len, I mean, could this be a nutritional issue? I mean, my, my nutrition hasn't really changed in that year period. It's un I would say it's unlikely. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, your what? What was your total protein? Was that in normal range? No, it was also low. It went. It was uh, the, the most recent was five point two, and it had been at a six point four in the normal range, considered normal range. So that's gone lower. Yeah, that's why I was asking about the kidney function because I mean, you could be losing albumin in your urine, which could change the mm -hmm. the, the albumin globulin ratio. It could lower your protein. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not really sure. You, you'd need to be, well, first of all, as they suggested, it should be repeated. And then if that uh, result persists, they probably want to work you up in some way. But uh, mm -hmm. I doubt mm -hmm. that it's nutrition. I also doubt that it's ADT. Yeah, the bun was six, is 16. The bun was normal. Uh, I mean, everything else was in well within normal range except for protein. Globulin and the A B EG ratio, as you call it. Uh, my my uh, eight type A one C is back to normal. Thank goodness, thank God. Uh, so that was it. That popped out. So let me what just was ask. Your AG ratio, what was your A G ratio before and after? Uh, my A G ratio uh, after was a three O. And hang on one second here. Uh, I got to get back to my foes because I took a. And before it was a one five. Well, so there, it went I mean, from a one five to a three zero. Research, quick literature search says dehydration can do it. I've been drinking a ton, man. I mean, I, I just, I mean, that, <laughs> I really am good about my water intake. Has anybody else faced these issues on the call? Because I'm not sure we're the best people to be diagnosing it, but you know, has, if anybody else has experienced these issues, that 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 might just be a lead. Anyone else who's faced any of these issues around albumin, protein? So you know, what what I would say is, um, repeat in three weeks. Give us a report, and. Um, okay. In the meantime, if anybody has a break, oh, okay, hold on. Carlos has got something to say. Doctor C, what's what's your input here? So sorry. 
from a uh, medical standpoint, uh, you know, your kidney function is going to be based on your creatinine and BUN. If your BUN you, is high, you're, you're dehydrated, but you just told us it's normal. Yeah, you college you're breaking you, up. I'm sorry. So the creatinine is the normal parameter. Are you doing your in the case then well, uh, it could be strictly a renal component that you would have to see a nephrologist for and that would be my suggestion is to see a nephrologist. I, I, I missed sure most that of that Carlos I'm sorry so what Carlos is saying Carlos you're breaking up on us um but what Carlos is right. saying is maybe you 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 should um run it past a nephrologist okay a, kid, a kidney dot. Guys, we've got to move on. I'm sorry to, to keep rushing us through like we are today. Jeremy. All right, thank you. Thank we you. Have, we haven't seen you for ages. We hoped we wouldn't, not that we didn't want to see you, but we would have been happy not to see you. So what brings you back to talk to us today? Well, um, I think I told you guys, I've been involved in litigation for, for a while. And, and yes. uh, I'm uh, which really tied me up for several months. Um, uh, in short, uh, there was very good news. Uh, I won the appeal with the Ninth Circuit on Friday, so that's wow. now freed me up. So that's a big deal. Okay. A very big deal. So um, uh, what I was going to say was that uh, I got a second biopsy. Uh, the second biopsy showed four plus three. Um, I don't know how many cores. Um, and I did, after learning about PSMA through this group, I, I, I uh, got a PSMA scan um, just to double check. And uh, everything's negative, bone scans, CTs, PSMA, genomic testing, genetic testing. But the new biopsy shows four plus three. Mm -hmm. and 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 uh, what happened was you know with covid i've been working out at home and i tore my abdominal ligament with basically a, a kind of hernia from what i understand um a pseudo hernia and uh tore my meniscus <laughs> so i'm in great shape and... so so the surgeons uh, collectively and i met with radio oncology and and the collective the consensus seems to be to go the rp route versus radiation at my age i just turned 60 and um i'm really debating the question is you know how do you come to that place of choosing radiation over over the surgical procedure right. and because they're both saying the outcomes are very similar with my grade um, with my current diagnosis. So here, here's what we're going to do, and you won't, I hope you won't mind. We're going to move you to next Monday night to okay. talk to Peter, because this is the bread and butter of Peter's call, and okay. you're four plus three. Um, and, um, you know, we, we didn't know for the longest time if your disease had metastasized or not, so it's really good to learn that it hasn't. The right. other thing that I wanted to mention to Herb, because Herb, this may be of interest to you for an offline discussion with Jeremy, is that Jeremy's litigation was around the use of cervical implant materials from hamster ovaries. Mm. And, um, and um, which has caused him um, significant issues. And um, so if you are interested in talking from your NIH standpoint, if you're at all interested in talking to him about what that was all about, I would be happy to connect you and-, and, yep, and sure. I would, Yeah, I'd love to see it, especially when you got to the Ninth Circuit, I'd love to see what they said. Yeah, it was unconsented use, by the way. Hmm, yeah. wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing it down on my list of people to connect and uh, I've got to connect Scott with Herb and I've got to connect Jeremy with Herb. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Scott and I have connected, so we'll be we'll be fine. Oh, okay. You and Scott are all square. I don't need to take right, care of Right, we're you. square. Okay, fantastic. I'm delighted. 
about that. And um, if you can get square with Jeremy, but before the end, let me know. If not, I'll make sure you have each other's telephone numbers. Okay. And you can talk. <laughs> but I think as you heard um, earlier, Jeremy, um, Herb runs a lab at the NIH that focuses yes. on um, brain and spinal issues. Great. Well, this, this there's a big spinal issue. This is uh, the Ninth Circuit decision was regarding spinal devices. So, mm. an unconsented use of them and mislabeling okay. of them. So, anyways, sounds like that's down your alley, Herb. <laughs> nice. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep moving and. Okay. Thank you, everybody, again. Um, and you'll get the reminder. Um, we will get the reminder for Monday night at the same time. Okay. Um, John A., you have a question yeah. for us. Yeah, I had a question um, maybe for people who have rib metastases. Uh, starting in mid January, I started having pain under uh, <clears throat> the last rib at the bottom of the chest on the left side and uh, and it has been increasing and increasing ever since and it gets pretty bad now and sometimes it goes away and sometimes it's there but I had a uh, a, a chest CT which didn't show anything and I had an upper endoscopy which only showed some gastritis probably not enough to be causing this pain and so it's kind of mysterious still i wanted to know if this sounds like anything like what happens when people get rib mats so who here has had spots seen on their ribs anybody up oh, herb and len okay who's gonna go first len you go first and then herb yeah, I had, uh, when I went down for my NIH PSMA scan, they noted a spot on my, oh boy, I think it was the uh, rib 11. It's like the free, whatever the free floating rib is, it's not mm -hmm. attached to the rest of the rib cage. Um, now, well, I, I just listened to uh, a lecture by, Dr. Hope, I think his first name is Thomas Hope, uh, on all different types of uh, scanning. And he said that one of the least reliable parts of PSMA scanning uh, for accuracy are rib, um, rib lesions. They could be, mm. you know, uh, sclerotic bone or hairline fractures, things like that. I don't know if that helps you, but that's that's all I can give you right now. But so I, I mean, I didn't have any pain or swelling as a result of it. Mm. But if that was your question, yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's how they picked up this. My rib lesion is on PSMA PET, but mm. I haven't had any pain, so I don't know whether it what's connected or if it's real. Mm hmm. Anyone else? Um, is anyone else? D David, did you uh, were you waving? I, I, yes, I I had rib meds also, but again, no pain, and they picked it up on mm -hmm. a PMSA. Um, but but she she uh, she well, we did two PMSAs and two CAT scans, and she just kept watching it until she was convinced it was. Uh, it was meds, and I had broken my ribs, so I had all kind of spots and stuff on my ribs. So, but no, but but no pain, John. No pain at all. Okay. Any anyone else here with to contribute on rib meds? Yeah, John. It's Ken Anderson. Hi, um, Ken. I, hey, I've been told you know bone pain is distinct. It's not the kind of pain once it starts that it doesn't continue. So I would doubt that it's bone pain. Huh. Yeah. I was what did you say? It, it's not the kind that once it starts doesn't. You mean it's constant? <laughs> yeah, it's not like something comes and goes. Well, mine comes and goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's probably not bone pain. It's probably okay. something else going on. John, have you tried any anti-inflammatories? Oh, I can't uh, take them right now because I have uh, 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 reflux disease. I went to see an EMT doc because I was had a hoarse voice, and uh, she told me I had to cut out all the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I did have a course of um, steroids of uh, prednisone because I've been coughing an awful lot for the past couple months. And uh, it quieted down the cough, but it didn't have any effect at all on this uh, epigastric or low chest pain, whatever you want to call it. Well, I'm going to see the medical oncologist at the end of the month. Uh, he may say it has nothing to do with prostate cancer, or maybe he'll do something or other. Okay. I had a bone scan when I first got diagnosed, but that was a while ago. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, well, I mean, when, when was the last time you had a full bone scan? Uh, approximately 14, 15 months ago, something like that. Uh, yeah, I definitely talked to Petrolac and asked him, does he think it's time? Because, you know, we, we we um, generally talk to our guys about getting, if they've got metastatic disease, getting scanned once a year or so. Oh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't, not everybody does, but um, we, 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 we tend to think, again, we don't give medical advice here, but I know if it was me and I think, you know, the other guys would tend to say the same thing. We, we like to see you get a scan every 12 months just so that you know where you are i mean as somebody said earlier carl foreman said earlier you know it's not all about psa and so um i think you should definitely be talking to petrolac about um you know you you'd like a scan and, and see what it says okay okay yeah, now what you. type of scan and what they offer you in the way of scans that's a whole nother story I don't know what they're doing at Yale right now, but you know, talk to him, come back to us, and then we'll we can we can we can go from there. But I think it's probably time time for a uh, time for a scan, John. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Mr. A. All right, Dennis, you have something for us. What's going on there? Well, I want to let you know that I am celebrating my fifth year anniversary of initially starting with my chemo at Fermagon. It's been five years. And also it's been five years since the reluctant brotherhood where I started with you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, there's, here's a man who was diagnosed metastatic and right now he's hitting that golf ball better than ever and he's not even on any treatment so yeah, we, we hope that will continue because i i did today go for my uh blood work some yeah. pretty expensive stuff and i will get the result in another week or so on that wow, so, wow. but uh, you know on another note i uh yeah. very interested in what scott uh, hogan and her come up with i think it's a very relevant subject uh spinal cord compression i was kind of given that uh diagnose not a diagnosis but information when i went from my second opinion initially on my initial diagnosis of large volume metastatic in the spine to the bone uh the doctor that i saw at mayo cautioned me, wanted to know what my activities were. And I told her the main one was playing golf. And she advised me to not play golf because of the risk of spinal cord compression. So I did stop for a while. And when I got started with uh, Dr. Singh and we saw the reduction in tumor size and everything in my spine uh, was a result of the dosotaxel chemo and the abiraterone and prednisone. Uh, which I, I still put a lot of uh, faith in, in that Abby doing 
does a great job of reducing the size of the tumors. And uh, I asked him about my golf, and he said, You're, you, sh you can play golf. So I've been playing since then. But it is, I guess, a very real uh, thing to be concerned about for people with bone metastasis to, your, to the spine. And well, uh, I don't know if, it, if it's a factor or probably a combination of things, both the bone density from the, from the DEXA scan, as well as, uh, you know, your, your disc composition. And yeah, what's going um, on with you? You know, there's a lot of factors, and, and um, it's one of the reasons why they, they always give you um, a buffer, or they should always give you a buffer of an antiandrogen when you start uh, an LHRH agonist. Um, and personally, um, I've known, I mean, the person closest to me who went through it was, was my very good buddy, Jerry Carnelia. Um, and um, I remember, you know, he went through the back issues, the back issues, and then uh, they took him into the hospital and basically his spine had collapsed and then he was in the rehab in the hospital. And, and um, but he did well um, for a while. He was pay, he was painting. I got pictures of him painting in um, in uh, in from a wheelchair. And we're going to have Larry Fong at the end of this month. Larry Fong is going to be talking to us on immunotherapy. Um, and Larry was 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 Jerry's doctor, and it's one of the reasons I came to to love Larry so much. He was so incredible. And um, we're going to be using the Superman picture on the uh, on the flyer. Uh, some of you have seen that in some of our literature before, and I'll save the story till closer to the time. But uh, don't be surprised if you see Larry Fong and Superman mm. together. Superman masquerading as uh, Jerry. So um, you know, just, I, just I reiterate what uh, Sylvester was saying. Uh, you know, he kind of took the wind out of my sails with his 22 years stuff. <laughs> but anyhow, regarding the drug advancement, um, at my diagnosis, uh, I was told uh, people with that diagnosis, with the aggressive treatment, 25% uh, of them, only 25% would make it to five years. And now the last I've read about it is, they were saying it's 35% make it to yeah. five years. So, okay. Um, so moving along, we've got three people. It's four minutes after seven. Um, we've got four people to stop by. We've got Carlos, Ken, Gary, and John Lowe. Um, Carlos, give us um, give us your question. I, actually, it was just a couple comments. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, Number one, uh, someone had brought up earlier, uh, taping your doctor's meetings, absolutely. Uh, there's so much that happens there that you only hear part of it because you're focusing on your questions. Likewise, having your spouse there to buffer and ask the questions you're not asking is great uh, to do as well. Um, secondly, for those of you that are also new, um, you know, this after you get over the initial hump of my world just fell apart. You need to focus on living life. Well, beyond that, uh, I'm doing pretty well. Got started back on Lupron. Uh, off my son under control with the uh, estrogen patch, and uh, my last uh, PSA was 0 0.4, down from 3.9. So I'm I'm doing well. Oh, well, we, we 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 like to uh, we like to hear that the um, that you are castrate sensitive. That is always good news. Um, of course, you may not like to hear it so much um, <laughs> because it means you're going to have to stay on that stay on that uh, LHRH for a while. But so, um, what did you say it was? Zero point. Uh, zero point four. 0.4 that's that's what that's what we like to hear 
Um, yeah. Anybody have any questions or anything they want to raise with Carlos? Um, okay. Yes. So, so what yes. what got uh, what did you get on the estrogen patch? I've never heard of estrogen other than the previous seminar that we had. The uh, issue with me was just not tolerating the, the Lupron well. Um, I'd been on it for about two years uh, along with the uh, Xtandi, and uh, probably between the two of them, I had a lot of issues with the swelling I described earlier, but also the hot flashes were becoming quite intolerable. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about every 20 to 45 minutes, I'd have another one. And I mean, mine weren't just a flush, they were just dripping sweat. And so sleep uh, at that time was uh, really comical because my wife was going through uh, menopause at the same time. And so I would throw the covers onto her and she'd throw them back on me and just all night long. And it's like, you, know, you don't get any sleep. And really that <laughs> never helps. So uh, I had tried different different medications that were suggested, the gabapentin, the venlafaxine. Um, none of them were really doing much for me. And then uh, ultimately I just said, I gotta stop these medicines and I did. I went on holiday, but now that my PSA has returned and my uh, PSMA shows uh, additional meds, I've got to go back on hormones. And so uh, I tried it for the first month, and uh, my hot flashes started coming back. Uh, not as bad as it had been before, but enough to know that this was going to be bothersome. Uh, so uh, I had come across information regarding using a, a estrogen patch, and uh, that is uh, the direction that uh, that I've taken for the last two months and I got them under control. So I, I do think there's a sense of well-being that comes from that as well, because I was a pretty much a bear for the first month uh, that I had gone back and basically losing all my testosterone overnight with uh, the garlics was probably a, a rough way to go, but needed to be done. Uh, and now I'm just trying to work my way down to see if uh, a, a 0 0.03 uh, uh, five patch is enough to uh, manage my uh, my hot flashes, and if so, then I think I can manage staying on Lupron for two years until the uh, immunotherapies uh, come out, saying that that's the way to go. So, Carlos, it's have fun. you um, have you reached out to Dr. Bryce yet? I have a call out. I have not reached. Uh, there's been no response yet. Okay. All right. I have well, all, all my PDFs I ready to go. So, Carlos, have you had any gynecomastia issues at all? I actually uh, had read about that uh, during my off time and uh, last uh, a year ago, December. I uh, knew at some point I'd go back on uh, Lupron. And uh, I, beyond that, just had uh, my breasts radiated. It went two rounds. And so, uh, you know. There was, there was the initiation of that. In fact, what was very interesting was when I went off of the uh, Lupron, uh, about six months later, my testosterone came back in the 400s. And as I thought more about it, it's like, you know, I'm getting tenderness and uh, uh, I was developing breast buds. And at that point, it's like, you know what? Your bonehead, certain amount of testosterone get converted to estrogen and you're having this a big influx that your body hasn't seen. And so there we go. Uh, it's like, you know, I, I let that settle down for a few months and then uh, a radi radiation person who said, sure, let's go ahead and radiate you. We can't really stop what you have, but we can limit uh, for the progression. And so that's been, so far, seemed to be effective. But that is a, an issue with long-term uh, estrogen. And so we'll see where things go. I'll let you know as time passes. So. Um, I just want to thank Vanita. Vanita, we did call on you earlier on, but we didn't hear back from you. But thank you for putting um, some suggestions in the chat window for some natural solutions to controlling hot flashes. We're always up for ideas because we always um, focus on this. Uh, estrogen patches are not our first choice. We usually tell people to try acupuncture first of all, but we know these estrogen patches can work, um, but Vanita suggests walnuts, greens, soaked fenugreek seeds, real licorice root, sunflower seeds, spearmint tea all help with hot flashes. Um, I've, got, I've got to keep pushing through here, guys, because I don't, I don't want to keep you 
too long. Um, Ken, just tell us um, the news that uh, people were happy to hear before. Yeah, it was uh, after the 14th round. I had my 15th round of docetaxel this past Friday. So PSA did not go up, which was, I was pleased about. In fact, went down two points, which wasn't a huge amount, but I'll take it. That's about it. Well, that's good. Um, let's see, you're three days out, you're probably feeling crummy, right? Well, that's where I'm at today. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. And how many days before you feel good again? Hopefully tomorrow? Well, usually Wednesday afternoon, I'm good. I can tell you, I've already, you know, I've got a fly fishing trip scheduled for color, for Idaho on the 12th, so... I'm not going to let it keep me. Three more rounds of chemo have been scheduled, though, per ball. Okay, okay, that's that's also. So you have you have talked to him, and he says three more rounds. Yep. So that that which would give you a total of how many? You, this was your thirteenth, did you say? No, it'll be a total of eighteen. So he said again. He says he says it's a maintenance plan. I'm doing it every not three weeks, every four weeks. Okay. And until my blood goes wacky or wonky or whatever you want to call it, I'm going to stay on docetaxel. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And you're good any with comments, that? Any comments from anyone in regards to things to watch out for after you get like the toxicity of docetaxel for all right now it's going on a year? How are you doing with neuropathy? You know, I, I, I had neuropathy after, after the first six rounds. So I take gabapentin, two in the morning, one in the evening. And it, seem, it seems like it's gotten a little bit worse, but not a heck of a lot. I'm still hiking and biking, and it's about the same. So it's, it's like me, just a nuisance more than, it's not a crippling thing. It's just a nuisance, right? Yeah, that's right, Peter. Yeah. I can live with it. I mean, if that's the... I can live with a little neuropathy, no problem. Yeah, that's where I am. And, and are you using um, gabapentin to control the neuropathy at all, Ken? Yeah, 900 milligrams, 300, actually 300 at night and 600 in the morning. So you t And you take that every day, huh? Uh, yeah, I have since I originally got it. You know, in the very beginning, I got neuropathy in my feet. So I've been on gabapentin for three and a half years. Wow, okay. Because um, I just learned from my own GP that you can use gabapentin um, uh, critically. You don't have to be on it all the time. If, you, if you've got issues, you can take it and then you can stop taking it. So- um, No, I don't think that's true. My doctor said no. He said I had to go off it slowly. Well, not I Paul, asked, my, my my local doctor, not Paul. Okay, well, I asked my GP specifically oh, about that. Maybe that. Doesn't, I, mean, I don't and know she, that. She said you can go on it. If you've got neuropathy issues, you can go on it, and then when they ease, you can come off of it. You don't have to be taking it constantly, because I, I thought you did, and I, that's what she told me. So we'll have to leave that one as an open question for the uh, for the medical community how about how about carlos any what, what's your I, what do you know about gabapentin uh i know that when i got up to those levels that uh, he was talking about i developed a one leg that was completely twice the size of the other and yeah once take, i looked it up take, i found out that that was uh, you know some people get that so that, that's one reason i stopped it uh i did learn um that that you should be taking uh, vitamin B6, 100 milligrams a day. More is not better, 100 a day. And uh, the other one is alpha lipoic acid, and those do help the uh, nurse cells that are uh, uh, helping keep your nerves uh, well uh, to uh, improve the neuropathy, which is the reason I went off, uh, reason I only tolerated the uh, docetaxel for four doses. Uh, by the fourth dose, uh, my neuropathy went from my feet to my uh, calves to my thighs, and at that point, I started dropping things out of my hands, and that with nobody to tell me how long that would last uh, or if it would ever go away, um, 
uh, I said, I've got to stop. And over a period of time, that all cleared up, except that I still have in the balls of my feet uh, a pins and needles uh, thing. Uh, it's not burning anymore, but uh, I'm still dealing with it. Uh, you know, this, this has been my third year out. Uh, so it has gotten better, but I don't know that it'll ever resolve. Okay. Um, there's some good stuff going on in the chat window about natural. I wish we had more time today. Maybe Vanita will come back and talk to us about this in one of our other meetings. Um, but there's some good stuff going on about natural products, some of which most, I mean, I'm aware of most of this, since I know some of you are aware, um, and some of you have tried, some of you have built in um, products like, uh, products, excuse me, um, herbs and spices like turmeric and, 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 and cinnamon and ginger into your, um, into your diets. Um, you know, the big question, of course, is the amount and whether you can get enough um, without taking it in concentrated fashion through a, um, through a, a supplement. Um, let's go to Gary Peters and then we'll go to, um, to John Lowe. And I just want to wish Ken all the best and bring back some good trout, Ken. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I've got a, I'm having my simulation appointment Wednesday uh, prior to eight weeks of radiation. And I'm um, getting some pressure to go with proton therapy, which I don't think is necessarily the right call for me. So I just wanted to ask you, um, my understanding is there's no evidence that proton therapy is any better than IMRT for killing cancer cells. Um, and my second question, if, if that is true, I wanted to ask you, is there any evidence that proton therapy will cause fewer side effects than IMRT? I think we've talked about this before, Gary. Um, and in fact, I'm certain we've talked about it before. I think I put a, uh, a study in the chat window last time. Um, I will give you my two cents and then I'm going to turn it over to Peter because he's done um, salvage PBRT. Um, there have really been no reported head-to-head -head trials on IMRT versus PBRT. So there is no reason to think that um, either one produces better outcomes as far as I know. That said, the study that I always quote is that um, they cause different side effects. The IMRT tends to cause um, issues lower down around the bowel and the rectum. Uh, the PBRT tends to cause issues more around the GI tract. And, and that's the study in, 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 a, um, in a moment that I will try and put into the chat window again for you. Um, so um, the downside with the PBRT is it's harder to find, it's more expensive, and sometimes the insurance won't cover it. Um, I can tell you personally um, that for me, I, I would not go out of my way to seek PBRT. That said, there are many people who, um, who have. Uh, Jerry Pelfrey isn't on the call today. I know he's done PBRT. Peter's done PBRT and others have done PBRT. Um, and so, um, you know, that's the only input. That's that's my input. Peter, do you want to continue the the yeah, sure. Just 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 quickly. I I've done both. I did 39 days of IMRT and then I did I chose to do 10 days of uh, proton for recurrence. And the main main reason I chose it um, was to avoid collateral damage. 
I mean, I, I think they are just as effective, but I was a little nervous of, of a few of the lymph nodes that we were going to radiate in my abdominal area were pretty darn close to some some organs that I just do not want to risk radiation uh, messing with. So that's why I went with um, with proton beam. Uh, so in terms of when you say killing the cancer, they're probably both effective that way. But um, they say that the proton beam goes to the target and not through the target. Um, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but anyway, it was the collateral damage I was concerned with. And insurance for guys on Medicare, proton beam usually is covered if you're on Medicare. Mine is mine is going to be covered, but my concern, I think proton therapy would be great if they know where the cancer is, but if they don't know where it is, I think IMRT might actually be better because it is slightly more diffuse. Yeah, right. Right, you are. Uh, yeah, I did mine after a. a, a a PSMA PET scan, so I knew exactly what the target was, and you want to have a good radiation guy. You know, I had one of the best in the country uh, down in San Diego. I mean, that's and he knew exactly where he was aiming and and uh, and what to do. So, and it had good results. Who are you? Who are you thinking of for IMRT, and who are you thinking of for PBRT? They would both be under uh, Dr. DeVille, um, who's a Hopkins doctor working out of Sibley. I went to him. Who's that? Jim, Jimmy. He did my radiation. I did uh, 37 IMRT with DeVille. Uh, go go ahead, Gary. Who is talking? I'm sorry, Jimmy, could you hear me? It's Jimmy it's, Greenfield talking. I'm sorry, I just said that uh, I did 37 IMRT uh, last February with DeVille. And we uh, well, it, it was it was you know he was he was he took his time uh, reading you know because you got to wait. And and uh, while they while he reads it, make sure that you're, you know, the the whole thing is the bladder has to be full and the rectum has to be empty, and those are that's that's a balance that uh, they're very particular about. And I it was sometimes it was hard to get the timing right, and sometimes I got tired of laying on the table and the bladder would get real full. But in you know in the long run, I was glad that he was, uh, you know, he he told me later, you know, he's, he's, you see, you gotta get that balance just right. We don't like delivering the radiation unless that balance is correct. So for that reason, you know, I like them. And you had IMRT? Yes, I did. Thank you. Sure. Good luck. Thank you. So Can you sure um, the doctor's name for the proton in San Diego? The proton is um, Rossi, Carlo, Carlo Rossi. R O S S E I. Um, and I just want to say, Vanita is suggesting that your bladder is full. Um, I think it really depends on, um, as we said earlier, as Herb said earlier, it depends very much on, on your anatomy. Sometimes the doctors want your bladder full, sometimes they want it empty. So um, we know plenty of people that had a full bladder. Um, when I went through mine, they didn't ask me to keep my bladder full. And uh, earlier on tonight, we had one man who had a full, was told to have a full bladder and another man who was told not to have a full bladder. So I think it's something you have to discuss with your docs and, and by all means ask them why. Um, so um, the bladder does buffer a little bit, uh, protects the rectum to a certain extent because uh, uh, there's a big variation. They want you to have 32 ounces of water. It is not possible for anybody to hold 32 ounces. And after think, thinking about it a lot, I came to the conclusion that many people leak 
so if they ask you to fill or drink 32 ounces of water most people only retain about 10 12 ounces and uh, so now like i tell all my patients hey make sure you can hold about 240 ml or eight ounces of water uh, it is protect to a certain extent and it is important at least i feel it is important i mean everybody may not feel it but i have seen people who don't have a full bladder bladder have rectal issues or uh, uh, what is it called uh, inflammation of the bladder and we don't want that after any radiation. You get this uh, bladder cystitis and water to a certain extent protects you from that. Mm -hmm. And but Herb, you said that you, you, for example, they told you to empty your bladder, right? Absolutely. And you know, when I talked to several radiation oncologists basically said, you know, you're, I mean, it was favorable for me because my anatomy was good and they did, there was clear separation of prostate from the other parts of the body. So they, they didn't need to do anything special like put in a spacer. And I think it depends on your anatomy. Everybody's different. I sure hope so because I'm the only guy that looks like that the, uh, had to have it full. But they also put me on a low fiber diet and I couldn't tolerate that. So they allowed me to go back to my regular diet. Well, and oh no! Out. I had the low fiber diet for sure. I did not have. I did not tolerate that, and they let me go back on my regular diet, and it worked you out. Well, you don't like pasta. I do, but I don't like exclusively uh, <laughs> fiber. <laughs> then I have to take laxatives, and they make me ill, so I can't do it. Okay. Well, you know, like I say, there's there's um. There's pros and cons, and I, I don't think that there is a right solution or a wrong solution here. Um, certainly for some people, a full bladder definitely works. I do agree with Vanita, or a half full bladder. Um, but then there are other cases where um, maybe it's not necessary. Um, you know, Maybe if I'd have had a full bladder, I wouldn't have had the rectal issues I have now. Who knows? At the same time, I totally trusted my my uh, radonk, and I still think he's one of the best in the country. So it's hard hard to know. Um, let's go on finally to John Lowe, who I think. Um, let, let me just go back to to Gary for a second. Gary, uh, have we have we left you even more confused than you were before? No. Um they want me to have a full bladder but i i think based on what um peter said is that i'm right in thinking that at this stage when they really don't know where my cancer is i'm probably better off with imrt so um i put in the chat window for you but you got you would have to sort of scroll up a little bit because there's a lot of uh comments going on in there tonight um that uh the, the reference to the imrt versus pbrt side effects you'll be able to click on that link it'll open in your chat window um thank john, you john lowe speak please i know it's a long time since you've been with us so You'll have to remind us about your situation and um, and tell us how we can help you. Okay, just two comments before I uh, give you a capsulized version. Uh, the gentleman who's in his 40s, uh, my experience has been I have not, uh, doctors have not always given me all the facts as I walk into some of these scenarios. And then it turns out down the road, if I had had the facts, I might have made a different decision. Also, for anyone who doesn't know, there is a machine out called the View Ray. They're out of Mountain View, California. It's a new machine that's available in about three hospitals, which is incredibly precise. The target is uh, their ability in real time. They literally monitor their treatment in real time. You might want to check it out on View Ray, Mountain View, California. Anyhow, my capsulized version is I had, uh, I'm post-op. Um, 
and my score, uh, I was at 0 0.17. The doctor sent me in to do a PET scan, a PSMA too soon. I was under 0 0.2. Then I was convinced to start ADT. And then I found out after that, which I found out afterwards, that the probability of success with IMRT was 50%. More research at UCSF has determined that a person in my case, or the, the small study at UCSF, uh, indicates that of uh, approximately 18% of the people in that study, uh, there was no prostate cancer in the bed. Um, so therefore, the whole idea is you end up getting radiated and you may not have any prostate cancer in the bed or in the lymph nodes for that matter. So I guess my question for the throat that I'm tossing out there is, do I come, uh, does anybody have a suggestion to come off of ADT? try to get up to about a 0 0.5 and see if I can be detected or roll the dice and get fully radiated. So let, let me just ask you, I mean, the last time I see you spoke to us was in March of 2020. You had an appointment coming up with Dr. Borno. Um, have you, and, and you were asking when to start ADT. So you did start ADT. Is that correct? Started ADT on September the 3rd this previous year. Okay, so you started ADT and 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 um what's been going on with your um with your PSA? Did it drive it down to less than 0.1 and you're still at less than 0.1? Yes, I went on ADT when I was at uh, less than 0 0.2, and my, <clears throat> my PSA is zero. Okay. So, um, you know, this question about should I come off so that I can drive my PSA up, up so that I, something can be seen is a really tricky, tricky question. We've talked about it before, Peter. This is probably um, sort of in your bailiwick a bit because I know you've wrestled with this with low PSAs and what to do with a PSMA scan, et cetera. You, do you have some thoughts for John Lowe? Yeah, I've done it twice, John. Once at once, uh, UCS, UCSF with a Gallium scan uh, and it found something. And then I did it uh, in December of 2019, again with um, at Stanford with a PYL PSMA scan, uh, and it found something. So, yes, in my situation, I did go off. You know, I've gone on and off of ADT, I, knowing that my disease was going to come back, knowing it was going to reoccur, but wanting to catch it at a very early level when it was still treatable. And that, so I didn't uh, surprise anybody with a uh, with a tumor the size of a grapefruit or something. So, you know, it was so uh, if it was me, that's what I would do. And I've even been contemplating doing it again shortly, but my doctors don't advise it right now. And uh, did you, uh, where were you at when the PSMA picked up your, was that came up on the imaging? Where, what, what was your PSA score? Around 0 0.8. Well, you were at zero. That was the first one. Uh, I believe so. I believe both of them. Yeah, the, the second one might have been might have been one, uh, but it was double. My my PSA was after I went off of ADT. My PSA was doubling every um, uh, under two months, every seven weeks or so. And uh, even though it wasn't a jump, a huge jump, I mean it was still below one. It was still doubling every two months. So I knew okay. something was going on. Two two questions for you. What what was the second PSMA test type of test you took? Uh, the the D, DCF PYL. Uh, the, it's, uh, it hasn't been approved yet, but it's coming coming down the road. I, I had it done at Stanford. Is that better clarity? It's a, supposedly a little better than the gallium, but if if you're if you're 
between 0.5 and 1, either one's going to do the trick for you, probably. So that test is called the 17F DCFPYL. DCF there are a couple of different versions of it. It's thought to be a better test. Somebody wrote to me today and said Tom Hope doesn't agree. At the same time, Peter Carroll thinks it's a it's a clearer test. So um, you you know depends who you want to listen to. Okay, Everybody, I'm sorry. You had you had both of those at Stanford. You said one at UCSF, the first at UCSF, the second at Stanford. Okay, and, and then after you after you found it, you you found the target, and then you went back on ADT, correct? I uh, yes, uh, when I, I did radiation for both of them. Right. Okay. Right. So so you located it, then you went back on AT, ADT, and then you did your radiation. Did I follow you correctly? Correct. Correct. Then I went off again and back you know, and, and and repeated the cycle. Oh, I see. So, in other words, they didn't get it entirely uh, no, the first time. It was in an entirely different place. Oh, okay. Entirely different place. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's a difficult thing to do, but I think um, it, who is your quarterback doctor at this point, um, John? The quarterback doctor. Uh, uh, Basically, uh, Dr. Boynoski, I'm dealing with at Stanford, and I've also had several conversations at UCSF. Um, their position is, one position is, Dr. Carl's position is, why would you radiate if you don't know where it's at? Another position, another physician's position is, there is no right, there is no wrong. You either go for it if you're risk adverse. If you don't, come off the ATT and see if you can pick it up. So it's really in the middle of the road. They they cut both directions. Um, the one thing I will tell you that I am aware of is that uh, and just become aware of it is that uh, I know you're a vet, and if there is a um, there is an availability for veterans to get a PSMA scan at UCLA, um, I should at uh, West LA, at West Los Angeles. Um, uh, VA, um, and uh, but you know, availability is one thing. Um, having a level where something will be seen is another. So as and when you think something could be seen, if you want to try and find a PSMA scan and you're having any difficulty, bear in mind that um, that the that West LA uh, VA is an option. Oh, West LA, okay. Got it. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, all right. I mean, I think we've covered everybody. I just wanted to acknowledge Vanita again. Vanita, are you are you still? Can, turn on your mic. There thank you. you. Go. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I learned a lot. <laughs> I hope we didn't make you too crazy here. No. It's always interesting. I see about 20 people a day, and it is amazing how different each person is and how much, really, how much trauma people go through. I don't think many people realize um, how devastating prostate cancer really is because of the side effects. Where do you practice, Vanita? I'm in Melbourne, Florida. Okay. All right. Another another Floridian. Okay. <laughs> well, by all means, stop by. Um, you know, if uh, if um, if you would like uh, participate again, sign up for our group. How did you hear about us? I was on Twitter. I, I'm I'm uh, I follow all the urologists, all the prostate okay. cancer support groups. And I was on Twitter this evening and I saw this meeting and I joined in. Sometimes hey. it's not possible because by the time I get home, it's pretty late and I leave early to the clinic. But today it was the right time and right place. So it's a pleasure, totally. Well, let me, just you. Tell you, 
Yeah, we're glad you joined. Let me just let us just tell you, we do have a YouTube channel so you can go back, listen to some of the previous recordings by all means. Um, if you sign up for our groups on ancan.org, you can uh, you'll get a notice of all of the groups. Some of them are recorded, some of them are not. And um, we'll leave it up to you. But anytime you want to come back, you're very welcome. And thank you for all the information that you contributed. We appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll sign up definitely because I'm very interested in all of this. OK. All right, guys. Um, thank you for hanging in. It was a long <laughs> night, a lot of people, but we we got there. Uh, we'll see you ne next week. It's Peter Kafka back in the chair. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you all then. And uh, thank you, Jeremy, for being here again. Delighted to hear your results. I'll make the connections. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Herb? Yes.